Okay, now we switch uh, gears a little. Uh, we have two local presentations uh, related to the same technology. And the first is uh, Jörn Skavlan. He's head engineer at the Hyperion Imaging Systems at the Department of Clinical Science uh, here at uh, Haukeland and University of Bergen, and also affiliated with the Center of Excellence for Cancer Biomarkers. So please, we are looking forward to imaging mass cytometry uh, as uh, the Google map uh, for tumors. Thank you very much, Arvid, for inviting me to this uh, conference. And I'm delighted to be here to talk about uh, image mass cytometry and the mass cytometry technology in general. Uh, I'm affiliated at the core facility here at the university, and uh, we are happy to have this new machine that we got some years ago. Uh, as you see, I have a subtitle of uh, Google Map for Tumors. And I hope this um, machine can help uh, the huge uh, project for, uh, let me see, next, yep. Uh, Cancer Research UK got like three or four years ago. I think they got a, over a hundred million pound budget to look into all different cancer and uh, give the information out to everyone. Of course, as the previous speaker has told, it's a huge amount of data, and I also think uh, Google itself is helping out with uh, the big data that is gathered in this uh, project. But also, with this project, I think uh, we, with this image mass cytometer, also can help into giving more information about tumors. Because many technology up until today have a look at the tumor and it's growing and finding the tumor, identifying in it in the body, but we have to go further in. We have to zoom in like you do on Google Earth. You look at the world, the country, uh, the area, uh, you find the city, you zoom into a uh, part of the city and you find the different landmarks. Uh, <clears throat> and then you can see the different uh, uh, parts from itself and how they are located in, uh, in the tumor. So this is the instrument. Uh, it is a mass spectrometer, actually. Uh, but the technology up front, how we uh, make all the sampling preparation, is actually based on flow cytometer or uh, immunohistochemistry. And the immune chemistry and uh, flow, that is an antibody-based recognition of the molecules of interest. Uh, in cytometry, you look at a single cell parameters, uh, and you use the antibody that you have conjugated with the fluorophore, because you need to identify the different antibodies that you have <coughs> connected to the cell. And of course, that can be uh, looked into in different variety of uh, plots. <clears throat> the same thing with immune histochemistry. You use the same kind of antibodies, and you can create really, really nice pictures from that. So why did we bother to go on with a new technology? Well, the limitation with this technology is that you can only look at a few markers at the same time. Uh, the flow cytometry have developed quite a lot, and you have uh, increased that number quite much. But immune histochemistry, you usually never see more, or use more than three or maximum four different colors at the same time, because uh, the autofluorescent and the spillover from the different colors to each other uh, makes so much trouble. So how do we do that in the new methodology? Well, we actually, we don't use these fluorophores. We have changed those with rare earth metals from the lanthanides area, uh, which shouldn't be in any cell or any uh, biological material at all. So we take these isotopes and we isolate them into monomeric isotopes from the dif uh, different um, uh, 
metals. So you see for, the, for instance, the nettolin, we have four different stable non-radioactive isotopes that we can use. And there already you have six different antibodies that you can conjugate. And as I said, uh, the readout is done by a mass spectrometer with a high resolution, and they can distinguish one mass from the other one with hardly any spillover. The only problem with the spillover here comes from the purity that is from uh, producing or enriching the different isotopes. <clears throat> uh, yeah, we're looking in the range from arsine to bismuth, uh, which has a molecular weight from approximately 75 to 205. And then you have a range of 130 different isotopes you can measure. Of course, some of those are highly radioactive, some are not stable at all, so you can't use them. So until now, we have the possibility to use some 50 of them. Uh, and there are people, of course, working on it to gain extra 15, 20 more. Hopefully, they will come soon. <clears throat> With this broad uh, possibility, with a lot of different antibodies that you can stain on a slide or on a cell, you can look into the broad scope of uh, applications that you see here, and you can also uh, conjugate the different RNA probes so you can detect uh, and quantify um, RNA in your cell or in your tissue. And of course, the research field is uh, not uh, unlimited, but it is uh, it's quite broad. And uh, we are today using it in both cancer immunity, autoimmunity, and uh, some of them have gone into uh, some clinical trials. So this is the machine. Uh, it was developed in or evented in 2005. Uh, I got the hint hunch of this machine in 2006, and uh, we went over to Canada to try it out. Unfortunately, we didn't get money for it until the third generation came in 2011, and then we got it. Uh, yes, so this is the suspension mode, where we'll look at cells in suspension, as we do in flow cytometer. And you apply the um, sample into the front there in a really, really uh, tiny droplet and a mist, where you have a maximum of one cell per, per droplet. It goes into a plasma, which burns up everything from that cell. It ionizes, atomizes, and ionizes all uh, the parts of the cell. And then we take away all the organic, uh, the, the atoms and ions that comes from, from the cell itself. Because they have low uh, atom masses, and we take them away, and we are only uh, detecting and quantifying the uh, isotopes from the heavy, heavy uh, uh, metal uh, yeah, isotopes. <clears throat> and then we, of course, can uh, look at all the parameters at the same time in the same cell. Then, a couple of years ago, we got a Christmas gift uh, in December where we got the Hyperion. They got this nice name, the Helios and the Hyperion, the son and the father of the sun, because they used the plasma, and uh, the plasma is this representing the, the sun and everything. Well, uh, also, the Hyperion, you can use more or less all the same antibodies to uh, stain the slide at one time. That's a huge leap for a pathologist, looking at three, four uh, antibodies or uh, proteins at a time. Now you can spread it out, look at so many uh, structure markers to identify the area you want to look at, and then go into the immune cells, look at all the cancer cells, 
and markers there, you can quantify a lot of different proteins uh, on the top there. <clears throat> so, just a brief overview of the technology and the workflow, where you have your antibody that is conjugated with your metal isotope, you make a great panel of uh, your project, project of interest, you stain your sample, and the cool thing is there, if it's a cue on the instrument, after you stain it, you can just store it dust-free in your shelf from a, a day, a year, two years. It doesn't fade. So that's pretty cool. And you can ship it from, uh, from another university or a research lab to us, and uh, we can have it on the shelf until we have a time to run the sample. <clears throat> so when you have are ready to run it, you will insert your sample into uh, the Hyperion part of the instrument that is pressurized with different um, <clears throat> noble gases, argon and uh, helium. And inside you have a really, really strong uh, UV laser that is uh, of course, that's strong that it will ablate part of uh, your section. And that will make a plume of uh, parts of the tissue that will be transferred over to the other machine and will be measured by the time of flight in the mass spectrometer. And since you have maybe up to 50 different isotopes in there, you will get up to 50 different images because the, the of course, the computer will recognize the x, y coordinates from the tissue where you have ablated a part, and uh, you will be able to build that back as a uh, new uh, image. And of course, you can combine as many of these different images as you want and uh, color them with your color of interest. And from here, um, you do the, <clears throat> the whole analysis. You're going to, of course, look at all the beautiful pictures and have a nice picture in your uh, <clears throat> presentation or in your uh, manuscript. But the cool thing here, and I can't say this enough time, is that you have now the ability to segment the cells and go over to a... Um, <clears throat> uh, take all the cells out from the tissue and look at one in one cell as you do in flow cytometer. And the cool thing with that is then you have the possibility to use all the flow cytometer um, uh, softwares and the programs that we have. But we also have one extra parameter that's the spatial uh, knowledge of where the cells are located in the tissue. That is so cool. That haven't been done for at all. And now we can see how and where the cell are located, which cell is in contact with the other cell, how many cells are in contact. Are they really far apart? Why isn't the immune cell able to attract or engage to kill the tumor cells, and so on and so forth? <clears throat> and there is a lot of new cool tools out there where you can do the round trip. And I'm, hopefully I'm not stealing too much of the point for Sina is coming after me, looking into the analysis part of this. But the cool thing, if you have done the segmentation, you can do a high parameter analysis here represented by a Disney plot. You can get out parts of that and find the cells of interest, go back to your slide and identify them. And of course, you can also go and look at the uh, neighboring analysis and the social networks of the different cells. So I think it's so cool that you can use this technology of image mass cytometry and also look at the same thing as a cytometer does measure like a whole cell. <clears throat> and again, the spatial resolution from, uh, from uh, looking at that tissue, like down to the left here, right, I mean, uh, it's, it can be 
uh, take it all apart and you can uh, apply back the cells that you are interested in. <clears throat> so just focusing back on the, the Google map of, uh, of cancer, like having a satellite surrounding the, uh, the Earth, you can easily find the tumor. And of course, the pathologist and, uh, and the doctors can, if they know there is a cancer in uh, the patient, it can usually easily be found. But if they zoom in on it and zoom in on it, you will go in and at the end find so much more structure that that is, is not only related to a tumor, but to the patient's tumor and how to cure that. So I'll quickly just end up with a few slides uh, where <clears throat> you can uh, here look at the non-tumor tumor and the vascular part of the tissue. That can go further over to uh, the segmentation of the cells. And that is usually how most uh, scientists is now analyzing it till now. But uh, pixel analysis is coming up in combination with IA. Uh, it's not all there yet. Can, uh, so this can go further to pix um, segmentation, network analysis. You can add on different molecule data if you have that. And in the end, you can also uh, then look at the social network, looking at great parts of uh, the, uh, the tumor or uh, the immune cells in uh, different uh, patient material that you have. And this is actually <clears throat> snapshot from the patient because it's taken from right out of, the, out of the patient, it is preserved, and then you can look at it. For many other models, we, when you look at molecule data, you will extract the tumor, you will have, make it into single cell, you will mush it maybe into a protein soup, or what you will call it, and then look at the different uh, molecules, DNA, RNA. <clears throat> but now you can look at it in, in uh, really real time from that snapshot of the time. So with this uh, last picture from uh, Rosa Ali from the Cambridge University, I'll say thank you. and the wonderful technology which yeah. is available. And I think uh, most people coming here from uh, radiology and that's spatial information. Uh, so now we can switch to, to a lower scale and apply much of the methods uh, into this kind of data, which could be very exciting. Yeah. You, I had just one question before you. Uh, you said X, Y coordinates. Is it possible to have it in 3D? X, Y, Z coordinates because then we are close to. <laughs> yes, it is actually uh, done. Uh, of course, this is tedious. It doesn't go that fast. Each pixel, you can take like 200 pixels a second for now. And if you're going to look at the millimeter square, it's about one and a half hour. And if you're going to have a layer of like 20, 30 different stacks on the top of each other, of course, it takes time. It's doable. Uh, and maybe it is, uh, you will get more information about it. But uh, yes, it has been done. It is continued to be done, but uh, time and money, as many others say. Okay. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Th thank you also from, from my side for, for this great talk. Um, we have a few questions from the Discord. Um, Nuska asks, um, and she's, she's also impressed with a cool modality this is, as you have conveyed. Um, one thing that is always a big challenge is to bridge multiple scales. Is there any way to relate uh, this data to macro imaging data, for instance, from CT or MRI? Well, I would say this is, um, as you also didn't mention, that this technology is also a really making an overview taking a snapshot and uh, looking at a, um, 
explorative part of everything. Uh, and from there, have the possibility to find structure and find parts of it. And that can be related further back to a maybe more rapid, more uh, available technology in all institutions. And yes, that is the goal for much of the site of work that will try to go from the high parameter, go down, and then uh, find something that can be used all over right. in all institutions. Yeah. Um, we have another few questions. Uh, 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 Heidi asks, how long does it typically uh, take to run one sample? Well, that can be like, uh, like I just previously mentioned, it's, uh, it works with uh, 200 hertz, so uh, you can have and it ablates one micrometer square at a time. So um, micrometer, a millimeter square would take uh, one and a half hour, approximately. And you can calculate from there. Um, Helwig also, of course, uh, um, congratulates you to this very interesting talk. Um, to which degree is the exploitation of this amazing imaging technology limited by the fact that we expect to look at a single image? Um, with all the many different layers that we have in between um, multidimensional information, very much as also Avid uh, uh, asked. Well, uh, how do I answer that? Um, no. do, 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 you, do you consider this the, the uh, 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 2D nature to be a major obstacle to, to this being, being exploited to its full potential? <clears throat> no, but I, th I think it's uh, even though it's a, it's a 2D, and uh, I would mention like, why can't you do it in 3D? Mm -hmm. You get a real uh, overview of uh, both the healthy and the deceased, and you can see all the boundaries. And I think from there you will get so much information that the part that you will lose in a 3D dimension, uh, I think you will gain that in all the parameters that you can add into this uh, technology and measure at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, Alexander um, wants to know, the Google Earth um, analogy is, is missing Google Street View. Could there be some role for um, VR or something similar there? The products of uh, uh, Nano come to mind. I'm not sure whether you know that. Um, could there be some value in representing the location and contact information in an interactive VR setting, um, if only for teaching or for the wow factor? Well, uh, Bob Boonmiller that uh, evented the, uh, the Hyperion, which the imaging part, uh, he has done <coughs> some cool 3D stacks of this, and of course he has applied VR to this one, working in and around and turning around the tumor, looking at it from different angles. So yes, it's, it's uh, still there, but uh, I'm not sure if that's so interesting in a two-dimensional as we are. The majority of the people are looking at this time. Um, yes, then we have a question by Norman. Are you able to describe any recent applications where the technology really made use of its excellent spatial resolution? There are some, uh, there's one melanoma study in, oh, where is that? I think it's Irish in Irie Lab in uh, Massachusetts, I think, um, <clears throat> that I've been looking at, uh, yeah, distinguishing in uh, good and bad prognosis, but I'm, I'm not sure in the details there already. But it, the main struggling in this new technology is going from uh, all the, the spatial resolution and how to f grasp that huge information. And it is, it is new for us in the field. And of course, that's, I think, maybe many of you can help out in, uh, in helping in an hour, doing this analysis. On, yes. on a, a practical level, uh, uh, Infrid is interested in how much tissue do you need to run the, uh, an analysis. Um, will you always need a tissue biopsy, or could you use uh, a blood samples or other types of? Uh, well, you can fluids? do. A, you can of course also do a, a blood smear or something like that. But uh, 
uh, we, we analyze rather small parts. So uh, we recommend everyone to do a TMA, where you have a small punctures of the tumor. You make it all on, on the same slide. That's uh, approximately 1.2 millimeter uh, circle of the tumor that you do a section. And yeah, uh, it's not, not much at all. So the majority use one micrometer, millimeter, sorry. To, uh, to do the analysis. And I think as a last question in the interest of time, um, we have a question from Martin. Is this technology uh, better compared to uh, spatial transcriptomics? Oh, I'm not this. <laughs> no, I'm, uh, I'm... No, I, I'm, I'm not into uh, spectrum. So, uh, well, I guess that, yeah. then we can conclude that it's different. <laughs> yes. uh, um, thank you very much, and let's move to the last speak of this session. Thank you. Thank you.